Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Stephen and Peter Sachs Museum. I'm Neshka Pfeiffer, Sachs Museum curator and your host and moderator for the event today with the Morning Society of St. Louis. Today's presentation, Mourning in Public, Funerals in St. Louis, 1884 to 1894, will begin shortly. We're very excited to have you join us. And we're able to offer accessibility features, including ASL interpretation and live captioning, which you can access via the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. To turn off or for more options, click on that closed caption feature. And thanks to the generosity of Mind's Eye, we're able to offer audio description for the blind and visually impaired. A note about today's webinar, the presentation will last approximately 40 minutes with time at the end for a Q&A session. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A function in the box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll sort through your questions and get to as many of them as possible by the end of the presentation. Today's program will be recorded and posted on the Missouri Botanical Gardens YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Today, we're all joining you from various places around St. Louis, and I'm joining you from the Missouri Botanical Garden, which I'd like to acknowledge is on the ancestral and occupied land of the Chickasaw Nation, Eleni Tribe, Iowa Tribe, Kickapoo Tribe, Osage Nation, Oto Missouri Tribe, and the Quapaw Nation. We acknowledge the ongoing relationships with these nations that they have with this land and urge non-Native people to educate themselves about this history and about the contemporary work of tribal sovereignty within these nations. Through this acknowledgement, we honor the elders and their descendants of these indigenous nations in order to bring visibility to these long silenced histories while working toward a more just and equitable future. With this presentation today, our speakers from the Morning Society of St. Louis are commemorating the 132nd anniversary of garden founder Henry Shaw's public funeral in August 1889, and they'll be discussing the public funerals of three notable St. Louis citizens in the late 19th century, Henry Shaw, Priscilla Henry, and Virginia Minor. The Morning Society of St. Louis is a St. Louis, Missouri-based civilian reenacting group with an interest in mourning, death culture, spiritualism, and the funeral customs of the mid-19th century through the early 20th century. The Morning Society's main focus is public educational events, and they've participated in events at Bell Fountain Cemetery, the Campbell House Museum, the St. Louis Public Library, Jefferson Barracks Historic Site, the Missouri History Museum, and the General Daniel Bissell House. Being a volunteer, Master Guide leading visitors through Bellefontaine Cemetery and Arboretum is how Tom Allen, one of our first speakers, was first introduced to the St. Louis Morning Society. Both organizations have similar beliefs on how to share information and stories, educating the public. Additionally, his interest in iconography and sculpture found at this historic cemetery made further sense in aligning himself with the society. Tom is also an active member of the 1904 World's Fair Society and a member of the Professional Tour Guide Association of St. Louis and a volunteer with the Missouri Botanical Garden. Etta Daniels, the second speaker, is the historian for his Greenwood Cemetery in St. Louis, Missouri. Greenwood Cemetery was established in 1874 and is the first commercial cemetery for the burial of African Americans in the St. Louis metropolitan area. The first burial at Greenwood Cemetery occurred in 1874 and the last in 1993. Research on the more than 50,000 burials at Greenwood has led to the cemetery being placed on the National Register of Historic Places. As research continues, we're adding to the body of knowledge of the growth and development of the St. Louis African American community and revisiting sometimes forgotten information about social organizations, customs, and activities of the past. And our third speaker, Catherine Kosemchik, is a founding member of the Morning Society of St. Louis and acts as the group's event organizer, recruiter, and social media director. She helped start the group after volunteering at historic sites as a tour guide and volunteer organizer for 17 years. Her favorite part of being in the group is helping people make emotional connections with the past and dispelling the myths that surround the topic of mourning in the 19th century. 
Thanks so much, Tom, for starting us off. Thank you, Nazca. So I think it appropriate uh, that we start with the founder of the Missouri Botanical Garden, Henry Shaw. For those who may not be familiar with Henry, let me put his life into context for you. Henry was born in Sheffield, England, which had been a center of iron and steel manufacturing for centuries, an industry in which his family was a part of. Financial difficulties would see the Shaws expanding their business to the Americas, enter a young Henry and a young St. Louis. The new business venture was a huge success due to Henry's business acumen, a fast growing settlement and a quickly expanding country. Henry's wealth and education would find him in the upper social circles of St. Louis society, befriending and doing business with the founding and leading families of St. Louis. Retiring around 40, he would begin to plan for what would be his gift and legacy to St. Louis. But you are here to hear about his death and funeral. Weeks before his passing, friends and acquaintances of Henry had noticed that a great change had come over him. He was spending less time at his home downtown. He was reading less and most surprisingly would spend hours in idleness. Henry's death certificate lists his cause of death as malarial fever and debility senile. At 3.15 on that Sunday morning in August in his bedroom at his country home, surrounded by his sister, faithful housekeeper and her niece, the superintendent of the garden and his son, two close friends and two personal physicians, he would succumb to the malaria that he had had most of his adult life and simply to old age. The adopted son of St. Louis was mourned citywide, even though he never held any kind of office, nor was he a, a prominent figure in state or municipal affairs, the citizens of St. Louis knew Henry through his labors for the public good. The next day, and for a few days after, newspapers would tell of his passing. Mourning bunting and wreaths were placed on the gates of the garden, as well as Tower Grove Park. The garden would be closed until after his funeral had taken place and the flags in the park were flown at half mast. Mayor Noonan would issue a proclamation ordering the city's flags to be flown at half mast as well. He would even direct city officers to be prepared to attend and or participate in Henry's funeral proceedings. In Henry's case, the arrangements of the funeral were placed in the hands of a committee, which was composed of the mayor, the commissioners of Tower Grove Park, and several other friends and leaders in the community, such as Thomas O'Reilly, Mr. D.H. McAdam, Mr. James Gurney, and Mr. George Barnett. Active and honorary pallbearers would be chosen. There were 12 active pallbearers, Chuteau, Kane, Leitner, Harstick, and Porter, to name a few, and 67 honorary pallbearers, of who Governor Francis, Mayor Newman, Yeatman, Barnes, Bush, Lemp, Engelman, and Tree Lease would be a part. The funeral would not take place until 2 p.m. the Saturday after Henry's death, with Henry first lying in state in his museum building. Then, being escorted to Christ Church Cathedral downtown, where there were two receiving lines, three clergy officiating over his funeral services, and the choirs of both St. George Church and Christ Church Cathedral singing. 
By the way, Charles Balmer would be the organist. He conducted the music for President Abraham Lincoln's funeral. After the services at the church, Henry was escorted back to the garden grounds for interment into his mausoleum. As the cortege, which consisted of a cordon of mounted police, the clergy and choir, honorary and active pallbearers, the hearse and family, friends and citizens, was preparing to leave that church, a terrific thunderstorm popped up. In time, the cortege, up to 107 carriages and a band at this point, made its way slowly to the east gate of Tower Grove Park, proceeded to the Shakespeare statue, and from there out the north gate to Shaw's Garden, stopping at the museum gate, where it was detained again as the skies wept fiercely, the wind blew, and lightning flashed. At the cessation of the storm, the body was given to 24 of the garden employees headed by Mr. Gurney, who led the procession through the walks and avenues daily visited by Henry, stopping where it had been his custom to linger. His body was then carried to the mausoleum at the back of which sat his sister and faithful housekeeper, where they saw the last rites administered. As the body was passed to the tomb between the clergy and choir, a low dirge was chanted and the coffin was lowered into the tomb. Bishop Tuttle then at its head read the committal service. Around the tomb, in silence stood old friends listening to the solemn words that committed a charitable man to the father of charities and wished his spirit peace. Next, we're gonna take a look at the life and death and of course funeral of a woman named Priscilla Henry. She was born approximately 1829 and died in 1895. Priscilla Henry was born enslaved on the Forks of Cypress Plantation near Florence, Alabama. The, the Forks, as it was called, was a large cotton plantation operated by slave labor. After living the first 33 years of her life in bondage, Priscilla's freedom was further delayed when the plantation owner simply refused to acknowledge the Emancipation Proclamation until Union forces invaded the area and used the lands of the plantation as a base camp. Once free, Priscilla slowly made her way north to St. Louis. Now, St. Louis could be a tough place to survive, and it was especially so for... Uh, this recently emancipated, illiterate, nearly penny, penniless, and not so young woman whose ambition was to make a good living as a washerwoman. She had no way of knowing that she would become one of the wealthiest and most notorious women that the city of St. Louis has ever known. Upon her arrival in St. Louis in 1866, Priscilla found work as a scullery maid at the famous Lindell Hotel located at 6th and Washington Streets. Priscilla's job included the daily cleaning of toilets and spittoons. It was dirty, nasty work, but the room and board salary provision provided Priscilla with a roof over her head and a few pennies in her pocket. The block square, six-story, 270-room Lindell Hotel was billed nationwide as the largest hotel on the continent and completely fireproof. When the Lindell Hotel burned to the ground on the night of March 30th, 1867, Priscilla managed to escape from the servants' quarters, which was located in a dark corner on the sixth floor of the hotel. 
but the fire left Priscilla homeless and with few options for survival. She found a room at a boarding house for colored women and attempted to start a wash tub and scrub board laundry business. That failed and Priscilla was forced to make an arrangement with the boarding house owner. It was the same arrangement that the other tenants had made. There was, a, there was a vacant room at the boarding house. He would let her rent the vacant bedroom and she would entertain male guests and do what was necessary to pay the rent. One of the male guests that she entertained was a man named Thomas R. Howard. Tom had been seriously injured while serving in the Confederate Army during the Civil War and he was mustered out of the military with a medical discharge. When Tom returned to St. Louis, some thought his devastating head wound had left him slightly crazy. He seemed to have had trouble holding down a job and frequently disappeared for weeks at a time. He started hanging around in the city of parts of town and frequenting the bordellos and bars. When Priscilla and Tom met at the boarding house in the late 1860s, they began a complicated relationship that would last for more than 25 years. Priscilla quickly learned that even though she could not read nor write, she possessed the skills and temperament to operate her own business. By 1880, when the US federal census listed her occupation as colored brothel prostitute. She had already been madam of two other houses of ill repute. Priscilla's houses had a reputation for being rowdy, but she ran her businesses with an iron hand and even assumed the role of bouncer when some of her, um, when some of her customers got totally out of hand. Her biggest flaw was that her lack of education and her inability to handle the financial aspects of her profitable cash only business. But Tom took care of those things for her. After Priscilla collected the daily earnings, she turned the money over to Tom. He counted the cash, paid the bills, including an occasional fine for simply running a house of ill repute. Uh, at least that's what the, the, the uh, law said. He also paid himself a generous amount of uh, money to cover his gambling and other debts. Once that was done, he gave Priscilla what he said was her share. Priscilla was suspicious. Even though she could not count, she realized that her houses made a lot of money possibly more than Tom had told her. So she started to skim a little off the top of each day's earnings before turning the cash over. In 1870, due to the social evils, the social evils act, prostitution had become legal in St. Louis. At that time, there were at least 150 reported flop houses, boarding houses, bordellos, and other houses of ill repute in St. Louis. All were owned and operated by white men or women. In 1890, that changed when Priscilla Henry opened her opulent bordello at 206 and 208 South 6th Streets, making her the first black madam in St. Louis. Even though Tom had, through his many contacts, helped her find and purchase the 6th Street properties, it was Priscilla's earnings that paid for them. Since it was against the law for black and white prostitutes to live or work in the same building, 206 housed black women and 208 was for white women. Black men could only frequent 206, but white men could choose either. Priscilla's newest place of business made so much money that special arrangements had to be made to account for it. Tom continued to skim ever increasing amounts off the top and Priscilla fully realizing that the value of her business continued her practice of skimming before Tom got his hands on the cash. 
fin uh, financially independent, as a matter of fact, not only financially independent, but quite wealthy, Priscilla requested that Tom assist her in having a family member from her past brought to St. Louis. Tom agreed. The relative was Nancy Lee, who Priscilla described as her sister. Nancy was now married and the mother of five daughters. In short order, Nancy and her daughters arrived in St. Louis. Lucy had purchased a separate residence for them, a two-story brick home at 4262 Garfield in the western part of the city, with the stipulation that the upper floor was to be used as a family dwelling, but the lower floor was to be another vent business venture. Eight young women were hired for, while Priscilla emphasized that neither Nancy nor her teenage daughters were to be involved in the business. That uh, situation worked well, at least for a while. In 1865, and I'm sorry, in 1895, just a few months before Priscilla's death, she reported to the police that her business partner, Tom S. Howard, had attempted to defraud her of $25,000 worth of property. The police had a vested interest in addressing Priscilla's issues and claims because they were, after all, making money off of her business, as well as other people making money off of her business. Upon investigation, Howard, uh, police discovered that Howard had appeared before a notary attempting to have the deeds to 206 and 208 transferred from Priscilla. All the property was in her name. Uh, even though he helped her to, to acquire the property, it was her money and the, the property was placed in her name. Um, the notary who, that, who they approached, who Tom approached to have um, the property transferred to him was suspicious. The woman that he brought in, supposedly Priscilla uh, Henry, didn't really look like Priscilla Henry. He was, she was shorter than Priscilla Henry. The uh, clerk figured out that she was probably an imposter and uh, made arrangements for Henry to come back another day, come back the next day to conduct his business. In the meantime, the notary went straight to Priscilla and told her what was going on. Priscilla reported to the police and also to her attorney and uh, Howard was arrested. Even though, even though uh, it was suspected that Howard was up to no good, there was never any proof, there was never enough proof to charge him. Howard was arrested on charges of burglary and attempted fraud, but it was suspected that Howard and the lady that he used to portray Priscilla uh, were in cahoots. And um, it was also suspected that those two had in fact killed a murdered Priscilla's sister, Nancy. She had just, Nancy had died the year before and Priscilla herself became ill. Uh, she had on recurring stomach problems, the same thing her sister had, and, but evidence of poisoning was never available. So even though the body of her sister was ex exhumed and tested for the presence of, presence of poison, eventually the charges had to be dropped. Priscilla died just a few months after that from complications due to her stomach complaints. She died on November 3rd, 1895. And her death in this situation points out a lot of information about death and burial customs for black people in the city of St. Louis, probably black people around the country. Uh, the crowd was so large that the police had to come in to keep the crowd away from the steps of her house. Now Priscilla's funeral, and her wake were held at her house at 206, in the parlor of her house at 206 South 6th Street. 
Um, Priscilla was an interesting woman in that even though her occupation was one that mm, people would rather not talk about, uh, she was recognized as a back as a cornerstone of the black community. She was a member of St. Paul AME Church, the oldest Afri uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church in the city of St. Louis. And as such, she probably was looked to not so much as a um, the, the owner of a house of ill repute or several houses of ill repute, but a very wealthy and upstanding member of the community. Her membership in uh, St. Paul's congregation was confirmed by the fact that services were conducted by a member of St. Paul, one of the elders of St. Paul, uh, a choir saying at her funeral, a choir from the church saying at her funeral. Now all of this, as I said, took place at her house. The, the number of people who came to view her body and to attend her funeral were so many that it took uh, 15 carriages to and the hearse to take them to the cemetery when it was time for her burial. For some, the newspapers were, were probably thought of pretty much the same way they are today, a lot of gossip. For some, it was a holiday. For some, it was an amusing event. For some, it was the, the loss of, a, of, of the, one of the cornerstones of the Black community. In addition to making her money, Priscilla had also uh, donated a great deal of her money to the underprivileged in her community. She donated to her church. She fed people from the back door of her um, houses of ill repute. So when it came time for her funeral, she was just, she was really respected. And um, as far as the newspapers reported that as far now North and South on Sixth Street as the eye could observe, human heads were protruding out of windows on the second and third floors and human eyes were straining to witness the last departure of the aged madam. Her funeral, uh, once her funeral was concluded, the funeral uh, procession, 15 carriages, such as the one you see in the uh, slide there, made their way to St. Peter's Cemetery in, uh, out in uh, St. Louis County. Uh, the reason that she was able to be buried in St. Peter's probably was her connections with some of the most influential people white people in the community. Priscilla was laid to rest with great fanfare, great respect. And um, at the, after the funeral was over and the will read, it was discovered that Priscilla's fortune at that time translated to well over $3 million in you know, our, ter our money terms. Priscilla's will left her money to her sister, Nancy Lee, uh, who by that time had, had passed away, and then to her five nieces. Uh, unfortunately, the five nieces did not, were not money savvy enough to know to, to, in, to make investments or whatever, and they literally lost her fortune in a matter of a couple of years. And they themselves then became a part of the uh, prostitution uh, community in the city of St. Louis. Uh, but Priscilla's life, Priscilla's life, Priscilla's death, Priscilla's funeral, all point to, all point to how the, a former slave a, a, a poor woman, a black woman, could become an instrumental part of a community. And um, even though she is not well known today, 
her influence was certainly met and felt during her lifetime in the city of St. Louis. As I said, she became one of the most influential, the most well-known, the wealthiest black women in the community, and uh, she was missed. Now we can switch to the next slide and Catherine. All right. The next person we'll be discussing today is Virginia Minor. She was born in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1824 to a wealthy family where she attended the school for young ladies. She married Francis Minor, a distant relative before moving to St. Louis in 1844. Like many women at the outset of the Civil War, she wanted to do what she could to support the Union cause, so she joined the St. Louis Ladies Union Aid Society. Organizations like this one supplied clean clothing, bandages, and medical supplies to soldiers on the front lines. Some women even left their homes to work in military hospitals. When the war ended, Virginia and many of the other ladies who joined her in the Aid Society founded the first organization solely dedicated to women's suffrage in 1867 the Women's Suffrage Association of Missouri. She served as the organization's first president. It's easy to see that these women, after doing so much to help the country, felt that they should finally have a say when it came to voting rights. On October 15th, 1872, Virginia made an attempt to register to vote in the upcoming presidential election, but was denied registration by the election registrar Reese Haperstadt on account of being ineligible based on her gender. After being turned away, Virginia, represented by her husband Francis, brought suit against Haperstadt in the Missouri State Court. She argued that the 14th Amendment entailed voting rights on citizens of the United States. If women were considered citizens, they too should be granted voting rights and turning her away was a violation of the United States Constitution. The courts decided against her at the state level, but the minors pushed forward and appealed her case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court upheld the ruling of the state court. Virginia would fight the rest of her life to secure the vote for women, but unfortunately, see it become a reality. She served in several suffrage organizations acting as the president of the local branch of the National Women's Suffrage Association as late as 1893, but was forced to step down due to ill health several months before her death. An account of her last National Suffrage Convention in Washington said, it is easy to read the lines in her expressive face that she has been a woman of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Virginia certainly had known grief in her life, having lost her only child, 14-year-old Francis, in a shooting accident in 1866, and her beloved husband and greatest supporter just two years before her own death. As an elderly widow, Virginia would most likely have remained in some stage of mourning dress for the rest of her life. By the late 1890s, some of the formality of mourning customs had given way to practicality, but the practice of wearing black, non-reflective clothing and a veil would still have been the norm for someone like Virginia. Virginia died at the age of 70 on August 14, 1872, at the Baptist Sanitarium on North Taylor Avenue. She requested that there be no religious services performed for her because the ministry would not support women's suffrage and she did not attend church for that reason. This was highly unusual at the time, but Virginia's life was still celebrated by her family, even with the lack of a formal funeral service. She was laid out in the parlor of her home at 3311 Lucas Avenue. A string of quartet, or a string quartet performed several beautiful selections, including Nearer, My God to Thee, and Rock of Ages, before her coffin was closed for the last time and carried to the hearse by six pallbearers, Messrs. Gallinet, Barnett, Houston T. Force, and three gentlemen of the Merriweather family. A large funeral cortege followed the hearse to Bell Fountain Cemetery, where Virginia was laid to rest next to her husband and her son in the family lot. In her will, Virginia left $1,000 to Susan B. Anthony in gratitude for the many thousands that she had spent for the cause of women's suffrage. 
She also left $500 to each of her nieces, daughters of her sister, on the condition that neither of them marry. <laughs> the rest of her estate was divided between relatives of hers and her husband's family. An interesting note about Virginia's burial site in Bell Fountain Cemetery um, is that the subject of her lawsuit, uh, the election registrar, Reese Happerstadt, is buried just down the road from her. And in a cemetery with 87,000 burials, that does seem like a, a bit of a strange coincidence. Thanks so much, all of you. Um, those are really, really um, amazing histories and stories. And I wanna thank everybody who is listed in the images slide, uh, Jennifer Perkins, uh, The Garden, the Missouri Historical Society, and, and the Morning Society of St. Louis for helping provide all of the images. Um, and I am going to stop sharing here so that um, we can perhaps take some questions from the audience. Um, for those of you who are participating, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, I do have a couple of questions for all three of you. Um, as you were researching this talk for, for us here at the Museum of the Garden, um, Obviously, Henry was the one who sort of spurred everything in terms of the commemoration, but how did you come to decide upon um, Priscilla and Virginia as other stories? Would you be able to share a little bit about that? And that would that's open to all three of you. Um, I, I guess I can, well, I know that it was, some of the recommendations were made by the Missouri History Museum, so we were very grateful for that help <laughs> to find other people that were contemporary to Henry Shaw that would have shown a different side of life in St. Louis than someone as unusual as him who was uh, had was very wealthy and of course very respected in St. Louis and had a different experience than most other people. Right, exactly. Um, uh, Edda, thank you so much for sharing so, uh, so much about Priscilla. Um, is it particularly difficult to research her life? Not really, I was very surprised. Uh, the newspapers have a great deal about her. Uh, by, by 1894, 1895, um, Pris Priscilla's activities in St. Louis were well known. They were not at all hidden. You know, having to deal with the police and having to deal with public officials, they knew who she was, they knew where she lived, they knew who she associated with. In addition, I found a book that was written about um, her life, um, as well as other tiny bits, bits and pieces of information. But I, I was really surprised to find that, no, it was not really that difficult to research her, to find information about her. And I got involved with this because my friend Catherine asked me if I would present Priscilla. So for me, this was not a lengthy research project, but as I um, became more and more interested in who, exactly who she was, it prompted to, to me to take a trip to the library and to uh, find out more about, see how much may have been written about her life. Priscilla was well known. Surprisingly enough, she was well known. Or not surprisingly, she was well known. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, was Henry Shaw never married? Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about Henry? Sure, yeah, I, I absolutely can. Uh, funny enough, I, when I volunteer at the Missouri Botanical Garden, I am at Tower Grove House uh, talking about Henry. So no, Mr. Shaw never took a wife. He never uh, was married. The, the closest he would ever come to that would be um, the case in which he was sued by a young woman uh, for the breach of promise. Uh, the way the story goes is he had supposedly loaned a piano to her. Uh, and when the time came for him to come calling for his piano back, uh, she would cry foul as she said that was a gift of betrothment. And where is the marriage that's supposed to be following this gift of a piano? <laughs> um, cutting to the end, uh, she would win. Uh, she won her court case, but Mr. Shaw obviously appealed, and that gave them more time to get more information on this young lady, and what was discovered was she was more than likely a gold digger. She had done similar things in the past, um, which is lucky for us that Mr. Shaw did appeal because it was a large enough sum that it would have definitely quelled his plans for a botanical garden here in St. Louis. 
And we happen to have another question about um, Henry. Um, Henry, uh, Henry Shaw had a ward when he died. Was he mentioned in his will? Uh, yes, he did have a ward. Actually, um, even uh, on Henry's deathbed, unfortunately, the ward would get back into town uh, only after Mr. Shaw had just passed away. So he just he just missed saying goodbye to Henry. Um, and he was mentioned in his will. Uh, and I'm trying to think specifically in, in what regard and, and for the life of me, I, I can't remember exactly uh, what he was given. Um, but um, I know he was remembered. And Tom, we have one more question for you. Are there not two mausoleums at the garden, the current one and another one slightly south? Um, what is the difference? So I absolutely love this uh, rumor legend lore uh, about the two mausoleums at the, the Botanical Garden. So rumor legend lore is that the original was built of limestone and the copper roof started staining the walls and Henry did not like that. So then he had the, the red Missouri granite one uh, constructed. Um, I'm a little dubious of this story, but only because I have seen some original images of that uh, first um, mausoleum. And it was originally constructed without windows and without a roof. Uh, this was a very common structure in uh, the Celtic regions. Uh, so Great Britain, that area, for a very fanciful uh, Georgian or even a Victorian gardens in which they would plant a tree in the middle of the structure and the tree would grow up creating the, a roof, if you would, for that structure. Original images of this building do show plantings inside of that structure, no windows, like I said, no roof because the sun is streaming in. I, I believe it may have been um, that uh, as opposed to uh, a failed mausoleum, but uh, we're still looking for documentation to, to solidly prove that. So more to come, hopefully. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, we've got a question for you, Etta. Uh, tell us more about Greenwood Cemetery, please. Oh. As you uh, mentioned in the opening, Greenwood Cemetery was opened in 1874, specifically for the burial of African-American uh, uh, remains. Uh, prior to that, without some connections and special permissions, Black people were not buried in the common cemeteries of, of the city of St. Louis. Uh, they were, we were not buried at, at uh, St. Peter's commonly. We were not buried at Bell Fountain commonly. Most black people were buried in the city cemeteries or possibly in a small church cemetery. There were four churches in the, black churches in the, in the city of uh, St. Louis or the metropolitan area that uh, operated smaller, much smaller cemeteries for the burial of, of uh, their church members. Now, when, Afri when Greenwood came along, uh, it eliminated the need to belong to any type of society, any special church, to live in any special city, because Greenwood was a commercial cemetery. All that was required was the burial fee. And in 1874, when it opened, that was $5 for adults and $2.50 for children. Greenwood operated as a uh, functioning cemetery from 1874 to 1993. And during that time, over 50,000 African-Americans were buried on its 31.8 acres. What we found uh, during research on Greenwood is that the people buried represent the history of almost every phase of, of uh, St. Louis African-American society. It is almost possible to start at uh, January 1st, uh, 1874 and go through the years and see how St. Louis grew, how the African-American community grew, what the input of the African-American community was. We have been very, very fortunate to be involved in not only the restoration of the property, but presenting the, the uh, history of, uh, of, of St. Louis. Uh, Catherine, for example, I met because of a, a specific group of people buried in, in Greenwood, and they were Black suffragists. Now, you don't hear very much about that, or di did not hear very much about them. But once we started to, re to research, we realized that Greenwood represented 
how much input African-American women had on getting the right to vote. That's great, wonderful. And I, I'll defer to you for this next question, Etta, but um, Catherine and Tom, please answer as well. Um, uh, we have a question about what other influential African-American St. Louis residents besides Dred Scott would have lived in St. Louis. And c can you also tell us where Dred Scott is buried? Because I'm not sure that everyone knows he is buried here in uh, St. Louis. Yes, he is buried at Calvary Cemetery in St. Louis, whereas his wife, uh, Harriet Scott, is buried at Greenwood Cemetery. And there were some social reasons probably that, that, uh, that affected th those decisions. And yeah, and so would there, so are there a, maybe a, a handful of other influential African-Americans that oh, you can heavens, mention? Oh, yes. From 1874 through uh, 1993, there were. Now, my focus is usually not on influential names that you would ordinarily know, my uh, focus is on how ordinary people made history each and every day and how that history added to the body of knowledge that we have uh, in St. Louis. I mentioned African-American suffragists. However, we could also talk about uh, jazz and blues musicians from, from the earliest, their earliest times in St. Louis, right through uh, people like Grant Green, uh, who played in the 50s and probably in the 50s, I think would be his, uh, his era. We have burials of Civil War soldiers, uh, Buffalo soldiers, uh, uh, First, Second World War. One of our burials uh, that we are very proud of talking about was a man who was um, a prisoner of war in Korea. So it gives us the opportunity to talk about that particular situation that war and how he uh, contributed to that. Um, so if you would come to visit St. Louis, uh, visit uh, Greenwood Cemetery, we would just simply walk you around to a lot of graves and talk about not only the person who was buried there, but also their life and times, there's the circumstances of their lives. Um, we do have, um, Oh, people like Charlton Hunt Tandy, who was influential in desegregating the streetcars in St. Louis. Um, oh, heavens. Any number of soldiers. Uh, one of our Civil War soldiers was instrumental in founding one of the um, small towns out in the Breckenridge area of, of, of the city. Uh, but we like to think, we like to view Greenwood and apparently the people who approved us for the um, National Register of Historic Places agreed with us. We like to think in terms of everyday people making history and leaving that legacy behind. And with that, we can say, this is what the African-American community of the city of St. Louis was like. And this is how the African-American community of St. Louis contributed to the overall growth and development of the region. That's right. Yes. It's always a spectrum of people. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've dropped a link, a direct link to the to uh, Greenwood Cemetery's um, website. But do you have any um, upcoming events or anything you'd like to promote about the cemetery before I uh, ask a couple of other questions of Tom and Catherine? Okay. Actually, we don't have anything on the agenda right now to share with you. Oh, no problem. Well, um, I hope people will keep in t keep uh, abreast of what you're doing there and support you in the future as well. Um, Catherine, could, would you like to share a little bit about the some of the costuming that you showed in the presentation on Virginia? Oh, I, I'm going to have you unmute yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the, uh, the items that were um, provided, the images were provided by the Missouri History Museum, and they were just items that um, a lady that would have been of Virginia's age uh, when her husband passed away would have worn um, a plain black dress and a, and a bonnet uh, with a veil when she was out in public. Um, depending on how Virginia felt about it, she could have worn that for um, about a year or even for the, the remaining time that she lived. Um, it was just really a personal choice rather than what people most think about as like a very strict rule about how long women had to mourn. It really was about respecting and paying, you know, respect and 
love to the person that you lost rather than something that was forced on you more often, I think, than, than people know. Thank you. And so um, do you have any upcoming events you'd like to share uh, with uh, everyone who's here? Yes, we have a annual uh, funeral reenactment and a tour at Bell Fountain Cemetery on October 2nd. It's called Consolations of Memory, and we'll be reenacting the burial service of a lady named Mary Palmer, who was also in the Ladies Union Aid Society along with Virginia, and she died in 1865. Um, and on October 29th, we'll be doing a uh, morning themed tour of the Campbell House, which is a Friday evening tour. And all of you can find the information about both events on the website for Bell Fountain Cemetery and for Campbell House and also our website, uh, morningsociety.com. Great, thank you. Uh, Tom, is there anything you'd like to add about um, what the Morning Society does? Um, not necessarily. I mean, we, we are very uh, into historical education. So uh, if you want to come to one of our events, uh, what you will not see is a skeleton or body popping out of a coffin. <laughs> we do not do that. Uh, but you will get a lot of great information in regards to this, this specific time period and how people, quite frankly, dealt with the, the, the death of loved ones. Wonderful. Well, I, we've reached our max. We've actually answered everyone's questions for today's presentation. Um, Tom, Edda, Catherine, thank you so much. And for all of the work that you did organizing and presenting today, it was so wonderful to have you. And for those of you who joined us um, this afternoon, we're just thrilled that we were able to bring this to you in the world of the pandemic. Um, originally, we had intended to do a reenactment, in fact. So maybe one day when we're actually able to gather in large numbers again, uh, we might be able to actually do that on the grounds of the garden. Um, but I want to thank everyone for, ooh, hold on, we have one more question that's popped up. I don't want to ever lose anybody's uh, um, opportunity to have access to you wonderful presenters. Um, uh, we have one last question. Were there other cemeteries um, for different um, people of color, like separated out in St. Louis? Do you have answers for that? Um, yeah. In, um... Greenwood, as, as I said, was the first commercial cemetery. It opened in 1874. The second was Father Dixon Cemetery that opened in 1920. I'm sorry, in 1902. And the third uh, was Washington Park, which opened in 1920. Now, all of these cemeteries still exist. Washington Park and uh, Father Dixon still do burials. Greenwood does not. And the reason is that it is some 38 acres of land and 50,000 burials, it is full. So, you know, we, we no longer have the uh, ability to uh, receive new bodies. So we have chosen to become a historical facility, basically. Um, at any time, you know, if you choose to come out and you want to learn about some of the people whose names you would not be familiar with at all, and some of their contributions, we would be more than happy to have you and bend your ear for a while. Wonderful. Thank you, Etta. Thanks for answering that. Again, thank you everyone um, for being here with us this afternoon and for this these wonderful presentations. It was so great to learn more about what public mourning was like here in St. Louis in the late 19th century. Um, best wishes to everyone for a safe and happy and healthy afternoon and weekend. And thank you all so much. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you.